Good evening. Uh, welcome. I'm Miata Fambole. I'm a Chief Executive of the New Economics Foundation um, and I'm going to be chairing us through this uh, lively discussion, I hope, uh, on levelling up. Will it turn Britain into a more equal country? Uh, we all know that levelling up is the buzzword um, of the moment. The political imperative around it, I think, is absolutely clear. Uh, closing the divide between people and places, responding to large swathes of the country that have been held back and voted for change when they voted for Brexit is an absolute necessity. I think the sentiment is clear. Uh, the phrase is catchy. Most of us kind of know what it means. Uh, but the question is, have we put... Uh, flesh on, uh, meat on the bones of this. Uh, the long awaited levelling up white paper uh, was supposed to give us a sense of what levelling up meant, how the government was planning to do it. Now that it's here, uh, the purpose of this discussion is to try and interrogate whether it cuts the mustard. Does it do what it promised to do, which is to give us a sense of what the government is trying to achieve, how it's going to achieve it, and whether fundamentally it will deal with this long intractable problem of how we close the divide between people and places. Uh, we've got a fantastic panel uh, to kick off the conversation, to provoke us, to hopefully um, answer some of these questions uh, for us. Uh, Stuart Lansley, who is visiting a fellow of the University of Bristol. He's also a council member of the Progressive Economy Forum. Um, the author of a number of books, including The Richer, The Poorer, How Britain, uh, uh, how Britain excluded the few uh, and um, enriched the few rather and failed the poor and uh, basic income for all. Uh, we've got Erica Roscoe, who is Senior Research Fellow at IPPR North, uh, leading a lot of IPPR North's work in the Northeast uh, with a big focus on skills, education, social policy, inequalities, arts and culture. And then finally, Andrew Carter, uh, Chief Executive of the Centre for Cities, who has over 20 years of experience working on urban economic policy for both the public and the private sector. Um, I would encourage everyone to please engage, ask questions, uh, post it in the comments, um, put your uh, thoughts so that we can keep this as fluid and as open a set of discussions. Uh, so to kick us off, um, levelling up white paper, it's now out. We have a sense of what the government is about, what it's trying to do. Does it custom cut the mustard? Is it a thumbs up or is it a thumbs down? Uh, and why? Can I start with you, Stuart? What's your take? Well, that, that's a quite a big question to start with. I, I mean, I think it's there's no uh, no doubt. I mean, this is this is the, the Conservative Party's big big idea, and I think you know potentially you know the idea of leveling up could could be a transformative positive idea that could lead to a better society but of course the, uh, you know nobody can really disagree with the sentiment behind uh, leveling up um and we certainly have a serious problem when it comes to the regional divide uh, the the evidence is pretty clear that britain sits pretty near the top of the uh, global league table for regional inequalities amongst the rich nations um uh, and so, but the big, big question is, um, you know, as Miata said, said at the beginning, is, is it going to work? Is it going to make much difference? Is it, you know, have we got enough money? Have we got the right strategy? Is Britain going to be a more equal society as a result of uh, this system uh, by the, the by uh, 2030? Um, well, um, I want to come on to just say something about the white paper. Uh, because the, the white paper is is a, a, a curious, uh, in fact, it's a remarkable document. Um, it's a bit like a football match. I mean, it, you know, it, it's it's a document of two halves. Uh, you know, the, the 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 first half is where all the goals are scored, and uh, the second half is 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 where all you know all the penalties have been lost. Um, the, the, the first half um, is worth a read because it really takes us on this incredible tour through the social state of Britain. I mean, it, it pinpoints uh, in some detail the, the scale 
of uh, the regional gaps that we have, you know, the, the, the health gaps, the gaps in educational achievement, the gaps in social resilience, uh, social mobility, and so on. Although there is one important aspect that is actually missing uh, from the first part of the white paper, and that's trends in inequality and poverty. I mean, inequality, since the late 90s, Britain achieved peak equality uh, in the mid 1970s. We have never been more equal uh, than in that period. It's also, the mid 70s was also a period of the minimum level of poverty. Uh, since and that, you know, that was an historic moment and an historic achievement. Since then, everything has gone into reverse. We, we now have more than double the level of child poverty that we had in the mid 1970s, and and, and um, inequality has surged. So, um, you know, Britain has a habit of heading these league tables of bad news, and you know, we are the second highest unequal country after the United States amongst uh, the rich nations. Now, I think it's very interesting that the first half of um, uh, the report was was written mostly by uh, Andrew Haldane. Now, Andrew Haldane, Andrew Haldane was, uh, was formerly the chief economist of the Bank of England, and he was called in uh, for a short period as a permanent, given a post of permanent secretary. Uh, and he's written uh, most of the first part. And it would have been really interesting to know, um, you know, you know, be a fly on the wall during those discussions when he, he wrote the first part. Uh, but what about the second part? Well, the, the second part, um, you know, really doesn't do justice to the scale of problem that, that uh, Haldane almost certainly outlined. Um, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's as if uh, whoever wrote the second part, you know, no doubt the Treasury had a big hand in it. Whoever wrote uh, the policy proposals, um, you know, probably hadn't read the first half. So if you ask me, uh, you know, how to, how to judge the white paper and where we're going, I would say, uh, you know, eight out of ten for identifying the problem, but a, a rather lower score um, for the solution. I mean, it's a little bit like those school reports that we used to get, or I used to get anyway, you know, could do better. Brilliant. Thank you, Stuart. So thumbs up on the analysis and the scale of the problem, thumbs down on uh, policy solutions and response. Uh, Erica. Thanks. Um, I think Similar to Stuart, uh, I, I'd agree certainly with with um, sort of dividing it into those two parts and, and the the thumbs up and the thumbs down um, respectively. Um, I think overall, I'd probably say we're sort of about here, about a half and half. Um, I think certainly uh, it's a step in the right direction um, after years of, of rhetoric around about levelling up from central government. Um, we've seen very little in the way of policy to match that rhetoric um, and this is you know in, instead we've seen actually increased centralization um, and, and as Stuart alluded to um, we've become more regionally divided than ever and we are you know top of some of those um, those league tables globally in terms of uh, regional divides and regional inequalities um, and this has real sort of avoidable and, and frankly unacceptable consequences for people living across the country. Uh, so, so thinking about that in the context of the white paper, um, I think that the, the commitment to broaden and deepen devolution is certainly very welcome, um, as is the pledge to um, establish a devolution framework. Uh, these are things that IPPR North has been calling for for several years now. So we definitely welcome those commitments. Um, but again, as you know, sort of to, to echo some of what Stuart said, um, at the moment, uh, those those policy solutions, um, with regards to those policy solutions, it, it's quite unclear how policies will be enacted, and crucially, how they'll be funded. Um, so, uh, so far, funding for the levelling up agenda has paled in comparison to local government austerity um for example we uh saw an investment um equivalent from the levelling up fund in 2021 
of just £32 per person in the north. Um, and that compares to a, a per person drop of £413 in annual council spending um, in the last decade across the region. So really, frankly, you know, the, the, the funding um, it is not measuring up um, and therefore we need uh, we need clarity on on how these policies are going to be enacted and, and how they'll be funded. Um, otherwise, the rhetoric will just continue to uh, fail uh, to turn into a reality once again. Brilliant. Thank you. Andrew, what's your take? Uh, good evening, everybody. So let me um, let me start an optimistic mood and give it a thumbs up. Uh, and I kind of three reasons why I start there. Maybe I won't finish there, but, you know, let, at least let's start in a positive place. I think the first thing to say why I'm positive about it is the fact that it exists. I mean, the very fact that we now have a levelling up white paper, I think, um, is a good thing. I mean, I think there were genuine worries that over the last two years that we weren't going to actually get one um, at all, or at least we wouldn't have got anything uh, in terms of what we got. And I definitely think for all of its weaknesses, all of its halves, all of its goods and all of its bads, it's better to have it than not to have it gives us something to work from and in some respects I think the challenge which we know well for through sort of economic development history the challenge really is to keep it uh, and to resist the urge to uh, to jettison it at the earliest opportunity which is typically what we do uh, in this country between governments and within governments we you know whenever we have a change of whatever persuasion we throw it all out and we start all over again so the fact that we've got it uh, is a good thing keeping it is going to be the big challenge i think as well as maybe improving it the second reason of three to start off i think is that um in the paper i think it does recognize the linkages between but also the differences between the two sort of big strands that you see in the white paper, which is one about questions and issues around productivity disparities between different parts of the country. That's a one big strand of the, of the white paper and what we might do about that. And then alongside that is another strand, which is more a broader agenda about quality of life or the standard of living more, uh, more generally. Two big strands that you see that run through the... The paper and i think there's kind of interesting that the paper recognizes the links between but also recognizes some of the, the differences and particularly i think recognizes some of the differences in the role that different places play in relation to some of those agendas you know recognizing that greater manchester plays a different role on those two issues than maybe cumbria does for example to pick two places at random could have picked others so i think that's a, a welcome Sort of recognition uh, and a degree of nuance and sophistication which should help when we then think about what needs to be done and what needs to be done where and then my third reason is because i think there is in the paper and actually i think the best bit in many respects of the paper is this emphasis on the need for institutional reform i think that you know the paper is is a, a recognition that if we are going to do meaningful things on le leveling up, that central government needs to change in the way that it operates and functions. So you see, you see some commentary about the way that individual departments relate to each other. Mayatna, you will know well from your previous employment history about trying to deal with how departments do or don't interact with each other and the degree to which they think about place. You know, there's a kind of re-emphasis or re-recognition on that. And allied to that, and this is where the sort of devolution thing comes in, and then we get into combined authorities, uh, metro mayors, et cetera, et cetera, is the recognition that local government itself will need to be reformed in some uh, in some ways in order for it to be better placed to, to take on some of those responsibilities and to galvanize and to make some of the decisions that uh, need to, to be to be made. So, you know, lots of other reasons, but those those would be at least three, I think, that. Um, give me a reason to, you know, give my thumbs up at this point uh, in proceedings. Brilliant. So it's good to sort of overlay some optimism. And I think the point that you make about actually the fact that we have a white paper, the fact that the agenda is being set in this way is definitely a step forward. 
I mean, from your introductory remarks, it feels like there are three different strands that I'd like to unpick and get underneath the skin of. There is one, uh, which is your point, um, Andrew, about the fact that actually the framework in terms of the outcomes it's trying to set does the piece looking at productivity and growth, but also living standards. Uh, and I certainly know that was a worry that we had that actually would focus so much on growth and um, and sort of miss the living standards piece, which is actually critical. And then there's this piece around the devolution framework um, and what that means and the institutions are set underneath that. Uh, there's a piece uh, that you raised to it about funding and the and whether that has sort of nobbled the agenda, if you like. And I want to take each in turn. Uh, so on the outcomes, I guess my first question to all of you is, you know, for me, it's a positive uh, that there was this mission approach. We have things that take us from living standards of jobs through to well-being. Is it too much? Does it mean that the agenda sort of loses definition? So is it a positive? Because actually we're thinking about the inequality challenge in a broad way that probably reflects the reality of people's lives. Or have they cast the net so wide that actually the agenda is all encompassing and therefore meaningless and hard, hard to hard to deliver and implement? Stuart, Andrew, Erica, in that order, reflecting on that question. I mean, I think that um, the, the 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 white paper. I think it's right to for for this particular strategy. Uh, not to range too widely. So I think, you know, targeting regions, focusing on a small number of areas is, is the right approach. My concern really is, is, is that the problem of inequality is so much wider than uh, regions. And, and, you know, capital spending in some of the most disadvantaged areas is, is highly desirable, um, but, um, is it actually going to make much difference to uh, the levels of poverty and inequality outside those regions? And I think one of the most interesting bits of the white paper is, is um, this concept of sort of multiple capital. You know, that, that what it does is it, it defines, um, I think it's six, I can't remember whether it's five or six, so there's human capital, there's social capital, there's physical investment and so on. Um, but it's not very clear to me it is I mean, I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that um, that I think we've had a lot of problems with physical restructuring in our cities, because I suspect the gains from those have really not gone to ordinary people. I mean, if you look at, you know, the big the big housing schemes in big cities from London to Manchester, they've nearly all you know concentrated on luxury building. Uh, which hasn't better benefited, you know, ordinary people. So, um, whereas social investment, I think, you know, does benefit ordinary people. And there's quite a lot of evidence economically that the multiplier effects, i.e., you know, the 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 extra uh, wealth and income that's generated as a result of public investment um, is, is better if it's spent on social investment. So, we don't know how this distribution is going to work out. But uh, so... I guess my two points are really that I'd like to know a little bit more about the relative merits of trying to finance these different sorts of capital. But also, I think what I would have liked to see is this the, the, the geographical paper to be part of a much bigger strategy to reduce inequality, to say, look, look you know, we want to cut inequality over the next decade. You know, don't let's be too ambitious, but we, we must reduce it and set some targets for that. Uh, so this seems to me to be, however successful it might be, to be a very small part of, of what's needed. Andrew. Yeah. So. Are we going too wide? Yeah. So good good strategies leave things out, right? I mean, and that's the whole purpose of good strategies is that they select what they want to do, and they recognition that they, you know, they're not doing anything. And I think there is a genuine concern in that in the end, in that the white paper has so much in it that the the issue of prioritization which is going to be important and somewhat necessary i think is likely to be fudged and i think that's a genuine kind of question that we should um we should be mindful of um i i would disagree with Stuart. i do think you know i think the evidence is is reasonable there where it's not guaranteed but if you look at some of our struggling places one of the reasons why we see these places struggling is a sense of the absence of economic activity in them. 
And we also often think about redistribution or distribution of the economic pie. But in many of our places that are struggling, it's the lack of the pie in the first place that is causing underlying kind of problems. We also know when we look at um, the kind of people, the kind of work that people are doing, uh, that people with lower skills, for, uh, for example, tend to be in mid or high level jobs in stronger economies than in uh, weaker economies. So there is something about the overall conditions of growth that are conducive, not necessarily, you know, it's not guaranteed, but it is conducive to create uh, opportunities for people to to kind of get on and uh, and kind of grow. Uh, and my last point would be the the most equal places or the most equal cities in the country are the poorest. And why, the reason why they're equal is because they don't have any high end activity going in or on in them. People might think that's desirable. I personally do not. I think we should think very carefully about how we can stimulate more prosperity in more places. I would start with the big cities, but I'm not exclusive around around that. I would think about how we can get more prosperity, more economic activity into some of our big cities in the Midlands and the North, and then figure out how we plug people in, but also we provide them with the skills and opportunities to kind of move forward on uh, on that. So I think there is there is something to be said about you know the the role of economic activity or dynamism both in and of its own right because we need it but it it is also a mechanism by which we can address not guaranteed but we can also address some of these inequality or distributional issues that we're all worried about erica what's your take have they got it about right or are they too expensive so i think i think having those 12 missions uh, certainly gives the paper focus um, and, I, and I think that that's, that's in some ways a positive thing. However, I think when you look at those missions, um, for me, that it really uh, misses out is uh, the impact on people who are at the, really at the sort of sharp end of, of these inequalities. Um, so the, one of the missions, for example, talks about um, increasing pay and, and productivity of, as we've talked about um, but we need to make sure that that's actually resulting in an increase in, in a real increase in living standards um, in the north over the last decade we've seen an increase in in work poverty uh, from 3.4 million 2009-10 to, to 3.5 in in 2019-20 so you know on the face of it you can interpret that figure as oh more people are in employment but actually more people are in in work poverty um that's that's not working for anybody shortly so we need to i think i, I think that the while well, the missions as i say give it some focus and um, for me it highlights what that focus is which is sort of um i think too much focus on, on growth and not enough focus on um really supporting those people who are um really in in desperate need and you know who have sort of fallen further and further into poverty um as a result of these inequalities particularly over the last decade yeah so so it does the job of if you like expanding the scope of the agenda in a way that's helpful but perhaps in doing that has sort of missed uh, those at the sharp end and the work that you need to do to try and close those divides. So I guess we touched on the shape of what it's trying to do, the outcomes, whether they've sort of got it right or wrong. I want to turn the conversation a little bit to the, the how and the what, um, you know, to the extent to which they uh, have moved us on in terms of trying to uh, solve the problem. Uh, and and we, we, we start with both Andrew's upside, at least there's something, and Stuart's uh, downside, which is uh, we're sort of half and half. A question from um, Henry uh, in the chat, uh, which is uh, the levelling up is surely not really new per se, is regional development is not new. Is there anything generally innovative in this white paper? So if we take it in the round, what's the bits of innovation? Is there anything you saw that surprised you or you thought actually this could be a game changer? Um, and then I'm going to break it down into the sort of the component parts within the paper after. Uh, Erica, to you first. Yeah, I think, I mean, we've been, we've been trying to level up 
uh, whether it's you know not not necessarily calling it level leveling up, um, but but we've been trying to do this, and various governments have been trying to do this for uh, well for decades, um, and so um, yeah, I, I wouldn't say there's necessarily anything hugely innovative in there. I think that your question about whether there's anything that surprised me. Um, there's definitely things that surprised me uh, just in terms of how broad the white paper is, um, focusing on things like health inequalities, which is, you know, positive. And, and we, I think that we do need to sort of take that holistic approach. Um, but um, but again, I go back to that, that first point that I made about how, how we're going to see these policies enacted. Um, and I think that the sort of big... Uh, elephant in the room here is that some of those commitments take decades to solve um, and uh, there's there's not really much of a recognition of that in the white paper so how how do we do that and how do we um, how do we make sure that we're actually working towards that longer term goal rather than just trying to you know see short term wins which which don't necessarily kind of uh, result in in greater equality in the long term. Andrew. Yeah, so Henry's question is a good one. I've heard this a lot. And my standard answer to it, so apologies for those that have heard me say this before, is that there isn't anything much new in the white paper, and that's a good thing. Uh, in some respects, what makes for, or what the components of successful regional development policy, or whatever you want to call it, uh, we've known about them for a fair amount of time. I think it reiterates and repeats and re-emphasizes the things they call it, you know, the six capitals, they call different things uh, at different points in the, you know, in the cycle over the last hundred years. But they're basically saying the same kind of uh, thing. I think the reality is, is that we haven't really tried leveling up in a serious way in this country, that's the issue. It's not whether we know what to do roughly, broadly, with caveats. It's whether we've actually been serious about doing that. And that's not just a, a critique of this government. It's the critique of governments over the last, um, you know, at least over the last fifty years in some respects. And I know again the thing I quote, I quote a lot. You know, look at the sums of money involved on German reunification. We've written about this a lot. 30 years they've been going at this they've spent two trillion euros they've closed the gap by roughly about a half a gap still exists but the gap um is still there maybe we'll come back in 29 and a half years time and see whether we've spent two trillion uh euros or not but it's a big chunky amount of money so i think we just need to be kind of mindful of, of what we're talking about i think the missions going through to 2030 they're not perfect but it's not next two years. I think there's a nod, at least by the government, in a direction that these things take time and they are kind of alluding to that. No government is going to say, you know, we're going to wait for the next 30 years, come back and judge us then. That's just not the way political cycles work. It would be silly for us to kind of think that that's what they would, uh, they would kind of do in that space. But I go back to my second point for being optimistic. I was genuinely surprised and pleased whether it happens is a different issue, but I was surprised and pleased in the white paper about this, this centrality of institutional reform at the national or central and local government level as being key components for then delivering good policy or crafting good policy at the national and the, the local level. That gave me heart that essentially all of that wasn't jettisoned and ignored from what's been going on over the last decade or, or maybe longer. And I think there is something genuine to build on that if if the government sees it through and it may not other governments have said that warm words and have not followed them through but again that gives me something to move uh, move forward with i think and Stuart, what's your take well i mean we we've we've tried uh, regional policy uh, in in this country since the war um and um a, you know and then we've had you know we had we had we changed sort of um position in the 1980s when effectively regional policy was dropped although there was there was a, quite a vibrant inner city policy focused on just a handful of, of inner cities 
Um, and the interesting thing about the 80s, of course, and, and, and 90s was that um, essentially, uh, you know, the policy was driven um, by the idea that markets are best, you know, you can't pick the winners and so on. And um, the state can't really help uh, regions to, uh, to, 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 to get be more prosperous. So this white paper kind of represents um, a kind of end of that, doesn't it? I mean, I think one of the characteristics of the white paper is that it's, it, it's part of this transition away from the a pro-market agenda of the past, it, it, back to to saying the state the state has a role. So I think that is that is quite significant. Although you know it's not new, it's, it's taking us, us back to the past. I think there's a, 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 I mean, I think there's a couple of. Um, on the other hand, it's it's only partially um, uh, about the state because um, I mean, as I understand it, central. To, to the strategy is is the introduction of six or is it eight free ports, um, uh, which is a little bit like you know the way Canary Wharf was was built, a little bit like you know the Singapore growth model and so on. So it seems that the government is sort of trying two different strategies side by side. So there's the strategy of uh, st you know public capital spending uh, with the emphasis chosen locally and then on the accompanied by um you know an emphasis on free markets as well uh that's not necessarily a bad thing but i mean i think it um it, it, it it's not totally new but it's kind of a little bit bigger than, than, than regional policy of the past i would say um can I, can I pick up on a point that both uh, Erica and Andrew um, made and uh, perhaps uh, bring in uh, Nicolette's comment, uh, which is uh, a key weakness in the policy prescription for me is that they are too top down and so stifle innovation from those who know best how and where to intervene in a particular place. Um, and I have to say, I probably share some of that sentiment, uh, which, which sort of takes us to this question of devolution and institutions. Uh, to the government's credit, uh, there is a chunky bit in there, uh, and it didn't have to be in there. There was a point in which I was worried that we wouldn't see a big sort of strand on devolution. And I think the sort of question that I have for you is, is it enough? Because um, broadly, they've opted for a hybrid between taking a kind of ad hoc negotiated devolution approach, rather than saying we're just going to push power to these places in one big bang. Um, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Uh, what are the upsides and downsides of that? So have they gone far enough? And then a sort of follow on question, if I can, just to try and help them out. If you could pick say one or two areas that you thought we've got to have large-scale devolution and this would be catalytic what would that be you know you know if you were writing it and you were sort of acknowledging the 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 unwillingness of uh, whitehall to ever uh, let go of power but recognizing that to deliver the agenda you've got to push these things out what would those things be um and uh, perhaps if i can start uh, with andrew this time yeah, great question, uh, Meata, particularly on the first one. So, I mean, this is a this is a continuation of the deal based approach, which you know uh, very well. You know, this is where government sets out an offer and it leaves places to decide whether they wish to take them out. Uh, it's also in the white paper. What you'll see is essentially the existing uh, metro mayor areas. Let me call it them that are essentially held constant. They're they're held at a level. And essentially what the white paper is saying to everywhere else who doesn't have a devolution deal is that you can catch these places up. I think that's a mistake. Uh, I think we can allow these other places to have more of whatever they want. But holding the existing devolution deal sort of constant, I think, is a mistake because we know, you know very well, when we look at what the devolution deals are for Greater Manchester or Greater Liverpool, et cetera, et cetera, and whilst they're better than other places in the UK because they haven't got anything, or at least in, in England, compared to their European counterparts, they have much greater policy uh, scope and depth and fiscal scope and depth. Uh, they're pretty kind of pallid or weakish uh, kind of deals thus far. So I was hoping for, you know, a furthering of existing deals whilst we also spread 
the deal uh, based approach out. But it does raise an interesting question, which is how committed really is government to devolution? If, if government genuinely believes that devolution is very important, it would seem that you would want to push it, maybe even force it, heaven forbid, onto all places because we think the benefits would outweigh the losses as a result of that. Now, people say, well, that's not very devolutionary, is it? Making places have these sorts of things. But if the costs, if the benefits outweigh the costs, you might want to kind of think of it going down that. But my sense is that, that well, they aren't prepared to do that. They're still offering um, this deal-based approach. So it's a kind of interesting one where we'll see some places coming forward and some places not. So we're going to continue to have this kind of varied geography or a patchwork quilt, whatever you want to cliche you want to use. I'm relaxed about that uh, to a degree, but I think it's in a kind of interesting idea. Whereas, for example, governments clearly committed, and I think they're right, to say in greater levels of R&D investment drive economic growth, which they do. And they have taken a decision to essentially say, A, we're going to increase the innovation pot and we're going to spend more of it outside of, uh, outside of the greater southeast. We're not consulting on that. That's not a deal. We're going to do it. Whereas in the devolution, mate, they're going, well, we think devolution's kind of good, but really we're going to leave it up to other people. You know, don't blame us if these places don't come forward. So there's a kind of inconsistency, which is kind of I, you know, inevitable in some degrees, uh, but nevertheless, I think is kind of interesting for us, for us, those of us that are getting really interested in that sort of area. And just on your, we can get into the detail of this, but as always, you know, if we're thinking about productivity and indeed quality of life, at the place level and then the individual level. I think one of the things, the areas where we've made some progress, but we should probably go much further, is in and around the skills, the adult skills base. You know, places across the country have some control and some influence over some aspects of the adult workforce sort of agenda, but not all of it and probably not the big bits of it. I think there is something to be said for them having more control over those, that adult workspace, that adult investment space on skills that, that would allow us to think about how then we can use that to draw people into the labour market in the first instance, but also to allow them to, to develop new skills and progress through the labour market as we see fit. So that would be my kind of starting, uh, starting one if, if, uh, if I only had kind of one. And Erica, this is obviously um, a space that IPPR North have done a huge amount of work uh, and in fact I think have set out a prospectus uh, for devolution. I mean, where, where have you sort of settled in terms of this ad hoc deals based approach versus um, a, a bigger bang um, and what, what do you see some of the opportunities and indeed some of the risks in the approach the government's taken? Yeah, so I, I'd agree with, with Andrew in terms of that, that sort of patchwork approach. Um, I think there's no getting away from that because, you know, the the, the country we're in uh, has sort of different levels of government operating, uh, you know, in different ways across the country. And to completely throw that out, you know, entirely and, and sort of uh, redraw those, those divides just simply wouldn't work <laughs> for anybody and it would cause an awful lot of headaches so um you know we just we we have to be pragmatic i think um and and just go with that that patchwork approach um i think i do have a, a little bit of an issue with with calling them devolution deals um you know it, it makes it very uh, transactional um and uh, i think that really what we'd like to see is um a sort of resetting of the relationship between that local and national um local and national government um i think what we'd want to see is is greater trust and collaboration um between the local and the national um and uh, you know that that sort of in my head goes quite contrary to to this i think we would still recognize that the devolution isn't necessarily for everybody um but we do need to, to have some flexibility so so what we've argued for at ippr is uh IPPR North is um a flexible framework that that works for for different places sort of large and small um kind of towns to cities um and i think in resetting that relationship um and making sure that the devolution is is sort of co-produced between local with local leaders um you could 
you know that that's what that's what we would sort of um argue for um i think your question about um what area would you uh you know, highlight is, is sort of number one for, for devolution. Uh, Andrew rudely stole uh, my my answer, <laughs> uh, but but I think that it's it's worth kind of uh, reiterating um, that skills and I'd actually sort of be be bold enough to say that it's not just adult skills explicitly that that could be devolved. Um, I think that we could we could go sort of broader than that. Um, I think that that could have a huge impact um, and. Again, as Andrew mentioned, like we, we've seen some devolution of the adult skills um, agenda, um, but what we've not seen is devolution really of um, funding, and and that's resulted in certainly in some places um, only being you know really being limited in in what what can be offered, um, and and therefore not really reaching that potential of you know what could be done with the evolution of the adult skills um adult skills budget um it you know if it were truly devolved with with enough funding um so i'd like to see and and what that results in is sort of devolution of blame almost because we we see uh local leaders being blamed because they seem to not be using the um that budget in the right way um and i think that yeah, so, so we need to see devolution of power and funding. Um, sorry, I sound like a stuck record, <laughs> but, but I think that those are the two sort of really key things. Um, but yeah, definitely, there's there's so much so much potential for for the um, the skills agenda, uh, particularly adult skills. But, but yeah, be broader than that and uh, say that so, we could we could uh, really transform places if if we devolved that. So we've got two, two votes uh, for, for skills. Stuart, I mean, just to sort of build on the conversation, um, at one point when I got very uh, jaded from rounds of uh, devolution deals that I was sort of negotiating in government, I sort of came to the view that you just got to follow the money. Um, and actually, if you could uh, put both funding and also revenue raising capacity in the hands of places uh, that would blow up the whole thing uh, and would move us from these sort of pointless, well not pointless, they're very important, from these, um, would move us on from these sort of painful negotiated settlements uh, to, to try and push power down. And so I guess my question to you is, uh, sort of thinking about the approach the government is uh, taking on uh, devolution, where ought to we, where ought should we be or where should we be on both the question of pushing down funding in the round and also the question of fiscal devolution as well well i mean the, the, of course the the big arm i mean the, the the i mean since the war no no sing, no government i mean in 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 you know opposition governments talk about devolution and although we've had de devolution to in northern ireland and wales we haven't had much devolution within England of powers and or money, um, uh, you know. So, so governments talk about it in opposition, but they they don't do it in power because you know minister they don't like to give up uh, Westminster's power. And I think, well, in fact, it's it's worse than that, you know. It, which it, you know, if we look at what's happened over the last sort of you know decade, is that the funding central funding to local government it totally has has been cut significantly i think it's by, by by roughly more than a half um but 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 at the same time government have, have kept controls over um rate rate you know local funding capacity uh so you know th this is you know this is squeezing local government and we we know the consequences that you know we, we we've we've had uh, big cuts in in social services and in children's services in libraries uh you, you, you know the number you know, the number of youth clubs that have, have have been cut is terrible and so on so what we're doing is draining local authorities in a sense of their decision making power so i mean so such a high proportion of spending now goes on social care there isn't much um scope for local authorities to to meet their 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 local needs and so on. I mean, I think the you know the evidence is that there is a lot of really good innovation taking place in some local authorities. Um, uh, you know, but we we don't central government doesn't do enough to 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 to, 
to, to give that ahead. So I, I think we, we need to go further to free up uh, local authorities. So, you know, I think it would have been if, if central government have cut their spending by 50 percent and and, and, uh, and then transferred some of that funding to locally, um, then, you know, we, we, we might have had a, a bit more leveling up through that process. Um, uh, so, uh, yes, I, th I think governments need to grasp the nettle and, and take the risk and, and go a bit further um, th than they've th th no single government has been prepared to, uh, to, to go down that road. So I'm, I'm going to pick up a point um, from uh, Patrick um, uh, and then ask a couple of questions off the back of it. Uh, so, you know, quite a pointed point. Useful policy, wrong government. Uh, a government whose current policies and their effects almost in every respect militate, mil militate against the concept of levelling up. Um, and I guess, and I guess the sort of the, 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 the the, I guess the question that I want to ask off the back of that uh, to each of you, although a couple of questions. Um, can the government achieve this if there are things that it's doing in other policy areas that are countering this agenda? One. Um, and then the one that I will, which we've sort of touched on, uh, but I think we should shine a spotlight because you've all mentioned it in different ways. Uh, one of the big challenges I think um, the government faces it's, is around fiscal constraint with the, the Chancellor has said that he's very keen uh, to demonstrate, uh, particularly after, in his view, the largesse of the uh, pandemic response. Um, and so the, the bigger mission in all of this is the level of funding and investment. And, you know, Andrew, you made that very good comparison uh, with um, Eastern Germany. Um, and so, and so, I think that that is a challenge. And I guess those two questions: Are there other things that they are doing that means that for all the good that we have identified and talked about, the agenda is mute because it will be countered by other things on the one hand. And then, secondly, this key question of investment and constraint around investment and the extent to which it hampers this agenda so much that actually the good that we're trying to achieve can't be achieved. Um, and if I maybe go in, uh, Erica, and then Andrew, and then Stuart. Yeah, I think I think that. So uh, I think it was Andrew who mentioned it in the previous comment um, that there was sort of this commitment to um, kind of large scale reform at the central level um, in, in terms of leveling up. Um, and we've definitely heard about that. Um, I think that that's a really positive thing uh, if it happens. Um, and I think that that has the potential to um, to mitigate against, um, you know, trying to deliver this levelling up agenda whilst we've got other departments um, working counter to that in, in ways. Um, I think that the, the key thing with uh, this sort of reform at the central level needs to be sort of greater uh, greater connection across different departments um, and as a result, more holistic policy making so that you're recognising uh, what, what the sort of knock-on impacts might be across, across different areas. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that I think that it's been mentioned certainly in the white paper and it, it's it's at least been acknowledged um that 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 needs to happen um so yeah we you know we now we just need to wait and see if if it will happen um which is the you know the the real um uh yeah what we'll wait for um in terms of investment yeah again just to be that stuck record again um i certainly think that there is a real potential challenge in the lack of investment hampering uh, this agenda. Um, I think that there's some potential for, um, you know, to, to see sort of private investment um, from, from some of the approaches that this government is taking. Um, and that's obviously positive um, for, for those places where that private investment is made. Um, but it almost goes contrary to, to the leveling up agenda itself because um, 
you know, then we're, we're seeing sort of unequal investment across the country um, and, and we will inevitably see the places being left behind. Um, so, yeah, I definitely think that, it, that, that there's potential to, to hamper the agenda um, if investment isn't made um, or committed to. Um, but, but also we need to see that investment um, being made, um, you know, by the local by, by at that local level we need to we need to see um the decision making over where that investment goes coming down to that local level so that it addresses the challenges in in different places because we know that there's different challenges in different places and so um we need to not only see investment from a central level but um without strings attached almost uh, we need to see investment being made to a local level to spend as as necessary um, to to address those those challenges that we're seeing across different places. Uh, and just to sort of push you on that, because if 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 the government if, if there was a government spokesman uh, here, they would say, "But look, we are chucking huge amounts of investment. Look at our pipeline of infrastructure investment uh, that we've committed to in the spending round. Um, you know, the biggest uplift in infrastructure investment uh, that we've seen um, in they would say decades. Uh, <laughs> I would say in the last decade." what's your what's your response to that um and in part interested in your take on the balance between the thing that's been called social infrastructure uh versus fiscal infrastructure where we know the government's chucking lots of cash yeah so i think i think one of the biggest issues we've seen with uh, some of the more recent spending commitments has been uh, that sort of competitive and centralised nature of, of spend. Um, the competition in particular really um, seems to, to tamper, um, uh, well, to, to challenge, um, create challenges for, for those local places. Um, because what we're ending up with is that uh, the places where they've, there's, um, they've got capacity to uh, spend time writing bids um, and they've got the, the resource there um, and people who are you know writing bids is is not an easy task um, and so places where they've got those people in place who are skilled in, in writing those those bids and applications they're going to be more likely to uh, be successful in, in those funding rounds um, and um, you know that just that furthers the, some of those divides um, uh, compared to those other other authorities and, and regions where um, where the, those those resources aren't in place, um, uh, and just to, to touch on your point about that social infrastructure, um, definitely think that that's something that we need to see a greater focus on um, going forward, um, because at the moment it, it's it's so growth growth focused and infrastructure uh, focused that um, we're missing the fact that there's, there's communities and people, um, <laughs> you know, in all of these places. And we need those communities and people to, uh, to, to make, you know, make things work. So, um, yes, there's definitely say that there's been perhaps too much of a focus on that uh, so far. And um, hopefully we will see that shift um, with, with, uh, coming initiatives that we might see. Brilliant. And Stuart, I mean, what's your take on that big question? Does this agenda become squeezed and neutered by other interventions the government is doing uh, that counters the work it's trying to do on levelling up? I mean, yes. I mean, it, 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 certain, it certainly does. I mean, there, there are, you know, other forces, you know, going on within the economy and, and you know, by, by governments that undermine and counter uh, some of the positive measures in in levelling up. Um, you know, I mean, the the, the, the you know the, the the cuts in universal credit, and then the decision to put up universal credit by three point one percent when inflation is you know almost double that. Um, you know, the fact that we have a a tax system that is regressive, that, you know, takes more from low income groups proportionately than it does from high income groups uh, and, and so on. The, 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 these, these, I mean, I like to, if we're going to sort of 
create a more equal society. We need leveling up at the bottom, but also leveling down at the top. The reason we need leveling down at the top is because a lot of the wealth that's been accumulated at the top is the product of practices and decisions that act as a downward force on incomes below. Uh, so, you know, the very process of, of wealth, you know, personal wealth building sometimes um, it, 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 you know, leads to greater poverty and greater inequality. So uh, the, 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 in, unless we so so, so the, the, there are contradictory policies going on. So the, 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 a lot of these regions, um, you know, the, the left behind regions and so on are poor, you know, are, are not doing well because there isn't enough demand, you know, because there's low wages, there's probably quite a lot of unemployment, uh, there aren't many high-tech industries and so on. Perhaps a lot of the demand actually comes from the public sector. Um, and part of the reason for that is that the, the income floor has been allowed to fall quite substantially uh, over the last two decades. You know, the benefit levels are, gen are in real terms uh, lower, you know, than they were uh, 15 years ago, and indeed longer than that. So, you know, the, the value of child benefit has fallen by a quarter, for example, and so on. So this means if, if the income, if they were to be raised, this would increase the incomes of people in, in those in, in those areas. And this of itself would stimulate demand. Um, so and the other thing that's I think that the other thing that's a sort of powerful counterforce uh, that no government has been prepared to deal with is is the way big business operates um, uh, in a way that it, so much business activity in the last you know three decades has not been about wealth creation. It's not been about creating new businesses, new jobs, and creating new wealth by business taking risk. It's been you know a lot of it has been about uh, extracting existing wealth by using a whole series of mechanisms, you know, the rigging of markets, monopolization, private equity, and so on. And, you know, this, the, 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 we can we can we can see the effects of this. If we look at, at the proportion of profits that are devoted to the payment of dividends, um, they have uh, they were around 15 percent in the 1960s. They're now over 60 percent. So, the, the, you know, the bulk of the, the, the gains in profits from economic activity actually go to shareholders. Uh, and we know that um, in Britain, 30 percent of um, shares uh, on the stock market are held by the, the top 10 global financial institutions. So what's happening is you're, you're, you're dragging money out of the economy. Uh, which is going to serve the interests of, you know, the global, a global rich class, which is undermining these policies of, you know, capital spending and attempts to get things going. This is why I said earlier on, I mean, I do think we need to fire on lots of cylinders if, if we're going to, to get that right. We need, look at, we need to look at the benefit system. We need to look at, you know, the, the way business operates. We need to look at the role of the city and how much the role of the city um, I mean, the reason, one of the key reasons why we have very low productivity in Britain um, is is that as uh, the, sh the share, the, the level of private investment has, has been going down as profits have risen um, because so much is going into dividends. Um, and so R&D expenditure in Britain, as we know, as a proportion of GDP is very low compared with other nations. It's very low compared with the past. Uh, so we, if we're going to, I mean, if we're going to really tackle these problems of productivity and growth and R and D and so on, quite apart from social investment, we need to tackle the underlying forces, which is about power in the economy and who really rules the economy and how far decisions are taken in the common interests uh, rather than the interests of a, a small minority. And if I can just say something quickly about uh, the fiscal constraints, of course there are fiscal constraints. But I don't know why, you know, the government isn't adopting tried and tested alternatives, such, such as uh, the issue of long term, long term bonds or perpetual bonds. I mean, this is how we funded the, the new towns after the war, by the issue of long term bonds. And Germany, you know, uses uses bonds. Other countries use these bonds. 
we could finance this capital spending uh, by the issue of long-term bonds. I mean, not short-term borrowing, but long-term bonds. And, you know, th that wouldn't take any money. That wouldn't uh, alter, particularly you know, it, 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 it make the fiscal constraints worse. Thank you. So, I mean, uh, I, you, you raise a good point because looking at the paper, there is definitely an absence on anything to do with income support um, out with, you know, the reference to wages. Uh, there is very little on the nature and composition of business. There's very little on ownership. Um, there's very little on community wealth building. Um, and I guess sort of throwing the question to you, Andrew, um, given some of the things that the government's doing, and indeed given the absence of some of these things that, you know, Stuart would argue are key to structural change within the economy more widely, is that new to the agenda to the point that it's meaningless? Uh, no, I don't think it is it to, to the point of uh, meaningless. Uh, I think it goes back to where we started i mean in part you can have sympathy now with the government trying to write a leveling up white paper right if they tried to write it and include everything that stewart's just said and what's already in it they'd still be writing it and we'd be you know we you know we'd be 700 pages in not just 400 pages in i mean this is part of the the challenge in a sense of the of any government once it sets out on a kind of area particularly leveling up where they were deliberately vague and it was deliberately uh, broad um, uh, for much of the, the two year period before we saw the white paper. So I don't think it's meaningless, but it is the, the broader point about trying to think about you know, the various aspects that government is uh, is up to at any one time uh, and thinking about the degree to which there's broad consistencies between different aspects of what the government is up to um or or not and i think that's a genuine uh question some of what stewart's uh uh touching on i think gives us a sense that unsurprisingly government policy making in its broader sense is not always consistent right i mean i don't think you get a headline on that in this country or indeed in any other country if you said that i don't think there's any government in the world that would be able to say yes all of our policies are broadly kind of consistent in delivering X or delivering uh, kind of Y. So I think, you know, it's not meaningless in that in that sense. Um, but I do think, I mean, just to pick up on your point, you know, I think there is a question about if you believe the levelling up agenda, uh, uh, in a sense, that it is an expansionary policy, right? I mean, it, by definition, it is saying there is untapped potential, whatever you, however you want to express that, uh, it is untapped and there, but it exists, right? So we're not having to create it. It's suggesting that there is untapped potential, which would, by definition, means it's expansionary policy, and it's based on the premise that investment today creates value, however you define it, however broad, tomorrow, not necessarily today, or maybe not even tomorrow, but literally, you know, into the the future at some point. If you believe that, you know, in, in a in a kind of very pure sense, then you know that gets you to your question or to your issue which is how, how are we going to pay for it in the short run? Stuart's talked about bonds, I mean, you know, government borrowing, et cetera, et cetera, or you can, you know, uh, tax increases of different persuasions and all the rest of it. But it is a kind of broader, bigger question about, you know, to the degree to which genuinely levelling up is an expansionary policy, i.e. The, 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 the economic pie is would be bigger if we did more of levelling up. And I think there is some some truth in that, but I think there's some not where it's just this redistribution between uh, existing and competing uh, ends. So I think that's that's uh, an, Im an important point. Just very specifically on Patrick's first um, statement, I just we did an event a couple of weeks ago. We had a, a fantastic uh, contribution from uh, a colleague at Ipsos Mori, uh, Nicola, and and basically you know they do loads of polling, of, particularly of the public and on levelling up. So for the first thing is people public have heard of it, which is a surprise because it's not just us nerdy wonks and all the rest of it that are interested in it. The public does seem to have heard of it. Interestingly, the public assigns levelling up much more to the Labour uh, Party than it does to the Conservative Party. They think this is a natural area that they would expect the Labour Party to be owning and to be taking the lead on rather than the Conservative Party. I don't know what to make of that, but I think it's interesting you know, you've worked in kind of governments, you know, over time, how things change. So I think there's kind of interest in there about different governments and the, the degree to which levelling up uh, will continue uh, or not. Anyway, enough rambling for me.
Thank you. Um, can I encourage any further questions and comments as we move to the sort of final part of our conversation? Um, I want to just sort of um, take us to conclusion by just picking up on two areas that uh, that feel like interesting um, omissions or areas that are undeveloped, uh, with that caveat that I think you've made, Andrew, that no white paper can cover everything. Um, but, but one is the foundational economy, the other is net zero. And on the foundational economy, I mean, the, the thing that strikes me, and indeed the, the point that we were trying to make um, uh, to government is, if you look at some of those areas that are held back, um, you know, I think two thirds of their jobs upwards come out of sectors like public services, retail, hospitality. Um, and yet that didn't really feature um, in, in the white paper. Um, interestingly, Labour are now talking about their everyday economy as a sort of juxtaposition to that. Um, and so just interested in um, your, your take on that foundational economy piece, um, whether it is a missing um, component within the government strategy and how problematic it is. Um, I mean, maybe if we take that first and then I'll bring in the piece around uh, um, uh, net zero uh, and opportunity lost or uh, won. Uh, Erica, can I can I start with you on foundational economy? Sure. Um, so I think that I think that there's a huge opportunity um, there, as you said. Um, I don't know necessarily that it's missing. Um, I think that there's certainly, um, uh, you know, things like hospitality um, and, and retail, those kinds of jobs. Uh, I think that they are perhaps can be rolled up um, in looking at things like placemaking um, and, you know, looking at, at, at how how places and centers develop and and begin to thrive um and looking at placemaking with regards to sort of what amenities you need from that um and i think placemaking is mentioned Pr pride of place is certainly mentioned uh, in the white paper um i think that that we could have you know seen a bit more in terms of what that means in in reality um because you know we've seen We've seen initiatives before the white paper um, talking about uh, pride and um, the the need to uh, you know improve bus stops and um, pick up uh, chewing gum off the off the pavements and that kind of thing, um, which is really just uh, uh, you know very cosmetics uh, the very cosmetics of things and. Don't get me wrong; they're important um, for that pride in place, but but you also need those those, those building blocks as well of having the resources uh, available to you, the amenities, um, you know, cultural opportunities, sporting opportunities. Stuart talked about um, you know cuts from local authorities and um, youth clubs and that kind of thing. So certainly you you need all of those kinds of things as well as that retail and hospitality which often comes with with so many of those um those those other functions that that you um you know with time um, but yeah i definitely think there could have been greater focus um on 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 what pride of place actually meant um, uh in in real terms um and you know how to go about this uh, really uh vague term of, of place making for sure. Stuart. It's not my, really my area of research there, so, so I, I, I'm going to duck it a little bit if you don't mind, but I, ju I just want to say, can I ju respond to just say something about Andrew um, thoughts before, or do you want to move to Andrew and then come no, back? No, no, come back, come back to Andrew. Uh, okay. And then he'll I have mean, a I double think, I, I wasn't, so. I wasn't um, a criticism of the white paper i wasn't saying the white paper needed to be you know 10 times as long um you know you know i it, it just feels to me it 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 it's very focused and that's good of course um but it's only such a small part of of this issue i mean for me one of the big failures of economic policy uh, over recent times, in fact, over the last 200 years, has been 
uh, the failure to acknowledge the importance of the distribution question, i.e., how is the cake shared? Uh, and that's essentially been left to markets, except in the post-war era. Um, and it's very interesting because I had, you know, I did quite a lot of digging around uh, New Labour uh, to, to see how much this question was part of their strategy. And it simply wasn't. I mean, you know, the, 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 the number 10 had endless seminars on social mobility, but they didn't have a single seminar on the question of how you distribute how you distribute wealth uh, and so on so for me this is kind of this leveling up agenda is all embracing it embraces it's not just about a few left behind towns uh, important uh, as that is it's about the way we run the economy it's about our priorities about what's the purpose of of economic activity um, and it's in, 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 in it's about, you know, saying uh, to, to me, all societies have to justify, all democratic societies have to justify their inequalities. And that means, you know, we have to have a democratic debate about how we share the cake. And I do not think uh, the way we share the cake at the moment is defensible. I mean, there are lots of ways it's tried to be defended uh, in this, you know, that you need high levels of inequality to encourage growth for incentives, uh, that it's a reward for merit, you know, and the rich are rich, you know, because they deserve it and they put a lot back and all this. None of these arguments stand up. So what, I, what I'm really saying is that if we are really, we've had all these shocks, we've had these wake up calls in the last decade, you know, we've had 2008 we've had austerity and you know we had covid and brexit and 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 that you know uh, all of these were an opportunity for us to rethink and so on and so there's a lot of talk about you know creating a better society and all these things and that's to some extent leveling up is you know the result of that um but i don't really see you know i really do not see a major strategy that says by 2030 you know, we're going to raise the income at the bottom and we're going to ha create a fairer and more equal society by ensuring that the distribution question uh, in influences our policy making across the board. So it's not really just about shoveling everything into a single white paper. It's about rethinking what our priorities are. You know, it, for me, it's a big issue. It's, it's, you know, it's a big issue like climate change, um, the inequality. Um, because it, the effect of inequality is, is so fundamental to people's lives, people's opportunities, the way the way society uh, runs, and also you know, and also has a big a big effect on climate change, incidentally, because you know the super rich, uh, we know that the super rich's um, carbon output, is, you know, is, is is higher than than the majority, you know than large sections of the rest of the population so the distribution question if we're going to sort sort the climate change out we, we we need to do something about distribution as well thanks Stuart. and i think that point is uh, very well made uh, which, which i guess is fundamentally the exam question for the government unless you're trying to re-gear the way the economy works in the round will you achieve the kind of the core um the core um, objective of leveling up um Andrew, can you sort of touch on that point alongside this point of um, the foundation economy, the parts of the economy that are often overlooked? Yeah, so let me let me take a completely different view on on uh, the history of regional or local economic development to Stuart. I think the problem that it has had, certainly post-war, has almost been exclusively about uh, distribution or shuffling bits and pieces around rather than actually growing the overall size of the economic pie. Stuart mentioned earlier on uh, free ports. All of the growth in free ports that we know of the evidence is entirely uh, redistribution from another part, often from the same part, uh, the same region in which the free port is established. There's no economic pie growth at all there. It's just shuffling pieces around local enterprise growth initiative, the Leggy scheme, much beloved by uh, Labour, did exactly the same. Most of these kind of regional uh, or localized economic development type things just take growth or activity from one part and they move it to the other enterprise zones did that historically and they're doing that 
currently. So in some respects, I would say the opposite, like regional economic development has been too much focused on uh, redistribution, the, the existing pie, which the pie has got smaller and smaller over time, uh, rather than actually thinking about how we can grow the size of the pie. And then, yes, we might want to think about how who's getting what of the overall growing pie. But that's part of the problem in in many parts of the north and the Midlands is that they are poor areas uh, and they don't have enough economic activity in them. And then you get to very sharp questions and issues about who is getting uh, the proceeds from quite a small bit of uh, the pie. Um, my other point would be, and I'm not defending the government by any stretch of the imagination, literally the first, the first bit uh, of one of their missions says, by 2030, pay employment and productivity will have risen in every area of the UK and the gap between the top performing and other areas will be closing. Now, whether that happens or not, that is literally what they've said. So if the gap is closing, growth is getting so absolute, people will be better off and the gap between top and bottom will have shrunk. Now, whether they do that or not. Uh, so I think we just need to be careful about you know where we get to on some of these, uh, these kind of questions and um, uh, these issues. I do think Although, you know, I'm going to be guilty of my own critique here. I think it, there was an issue or a missing issue in some respects of at least nodding to the, the net zero agenda, particularly as it relates to growth and expansion and investment and jobs and the missed opportunities that that can have just simply because of the, the geography of those kinds of issues. We know the retrofit challenge on the housing side is overwhelmingly in poorer areas where the housing stock is of very low quality. So we're going to have to invest uh, into those kinds of areas. But we also know that high emitted manufacturing firms typically are in poorer areas as well. So we're going to have to deal with the fallout as we move to net zero of those, those manufacturing firms either shifting how they uh, they get their energy uh, and in, in what form. So there's kind of big challenges on levelling up and the net zero. But also I think it tells us a little bit about you know, the ability of government to hold all of these things together at any one time, right? I mean, it's just, we want them to do it. We would wish them well to do it. I just think it's very hard to do it, which partly goes back to some of the arguments about devolution is trying to get to the spatial scale where we can bring some of these kind of things together, where places know what the net zero challenge is in their patch and what the levelling up challenge is in their patch. And they can bring those kinds of things together if we give them the license and the funding and the flexibility and all of that to kind of make those sorts of things uh, happen. So I think that's partly, I think, you know, some of the advantage that we might get through uh, more through a more devolved state. And I, I just final, very brief point. I do think you, you're right, Matt, in the sense that, you know, thinking about the terms and conditions of employment or activity or participation in the everyday economy is absent in the leveling up white paper. This is more your agenda than, than mine. And again, I don't know how inconsistent or consistent is the government's broader agenda on that, but you're absolutely right in the sense if, if we want to create places uh, or more places where people feel more in, more secure in work, where pay is relatively better than addressing those big uh, industries where we have high levels of employment in those kind of areas is going to be a critical part of it. Doesn't mean that innovation economy type stuff doesn't matter. It certainly does. But also, you know, the vast majority of people are not in those industries. And so thinking about the terms and conditions that, that people are working in those industries are getting, whether it's, you know, the contracts or the pay uh, or the sick leave or whichever it is, I think is, you know, is a big question that we we definitely need to come back to. Uh, and try to knit that into or connect it to the levelling up agenda. Brilliant. Um, uh, Eric, I'm going to give you uh, the final word before uh, trying to sort of wrap us up. Um, but just sort of responding, Andrew, um, I, th I think you're completely right. And I think it is always right and fair to remember that asking the government to hold these massive agendas is really tough. Uh, by the way, in the middle of a set of crises that they're trying to uh, navigate um, around. Um, it is an area that we were disappointed in uh, from a kind of New Economics Foundation perspective, partly because we see that there's a big opportunity, as you've said. Um, it, it's it's clear to us that whether the government wants it or not, there's no pathway to net zero without public investment. So if you're going to have to chuck public investment to the transition, why on earth would you not do it in order to galvanise and remake places? Uh, there's a potential win-win there. Um, 
but as you say, it will only be realized on the ground in a place. Um, so, so I guess, Erica, just getting you, get, getting you to reflect on this question of net zero, was it something that you, would ex you were expecting would feature? Was it something that you were disappointed didn't feature? Or do you think the government's trying to do enough just to level up? Yeah, I think I'm in danger of just just violently agreeing with with both of you, um, but but um, certainly uh, it was a it was a massive missed opportunity, and there could have been so much more in there, which um, which drew upon the the opportunity to to level up um, alongside responding to the the net zero challenge. Um, I do appreciate uh, fully the the. The huge um, challenge of of trying to juggle such massive agendas, um, and I, yeah, I get that. Um, but I, I think it also, in some ways, goes back to that point we talked about earlier about um, you know central government reform and um, the need for departments to to work more closely together um, to to sort of engage in more holistic policy making. Um, I think what we perhaps there's a danger that we might be left with though is that the net zero agenda is um becomes um much like uh you know some of the other challenges we've seen before uh, whereby people once again get left behind um with this people like they're having net zero done to them um, they feel like they're sort of having things imposed upon them um, because things aren't happening at that, at that local level and zero it's it's complex because we need to we need to see uh change on well a global scale uh, <laughs> being honest uh, but but we we need to make sure that we're taking people along with us from the beginning. Um, so making sure that people understand why that change is necessary um, and what the positives can be as well as, you know, what people always inevitably see uh, as, as those those negatives. Um, so, so yeah, there could have been um, an awful lot more said about net zero in the white paper um, to, to bring people along on that journey um to to engage people um and and um i suppose see that net zero uh, those net zero initiatives at that local level which whilst they it's it's difficult because we we need more than just initiatives at a local level um but we need people uh you know to to come along and um and understand why why those initiatives are in place and and inevitably uh, we're more likely to see that by engaging with people at that local level as well. So yeah, uh, for sure, the, there's a missed opportunity there. So I, I, I was going to wrap us up, but there's a question from Joe that I, I can't resist uh, but to throw uh, to the panel. And I'm going to ask you just to choose a scenario uh, and give a, 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 a one sentence response to why, then we can start to wrap it up. Uh, so uh, jo Joe's uh, question is in two parts, uh, leveling up agendas uh, in the light of collective development intelligence. Okay, first, some structural realities. If most of the UK is a playground service yards to the globalized financial games of London and the Southeast region, what is the most transformative response? Two scenarios, scenario A, um, try incremental policies to help regions to play the game of globalized competition centered on London and the Southeast, uh, but regions may never get anywhere near the upper levels. Uh, so, and that's the thing that takes us to uh, devolution skills, etc. cetera. Um, but scenario B, enable regions to play alternative kinds of games based on alternative concepts of economic growth and prosperity. I think, I think this is a, a big up to you, uh, Stuart, uh, where they are not automatically losers in a zero-sum game, e.g. Wales. Uh, question to the panel, which is the most likely and desirable scenario? Well, Those I are mean, two it, questions, likely and most desirable. So you can ask an A and a B of uh, likely and most desirable. <laughs> Stuart, you can start. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, uh, um, I, I think that his point, you know, that, that essentially Britain um, has got caught in, 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 in the wrong economic and social model. Um, and what's the way to respond 
to that regionally is 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 i think we need to turn that on its head i think we need to sort out the, the problem of you know the economic and social model first um uh the, before you know as a way a way which i think will then you know have a big you know, a big impact on the regional divide at the same time so you, you're so firmly in the camp of b for desirable is it likely uh scenario b uh, hang on based on Turning it in its on its head, alternative copy. Yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, 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 B. Yeah. Erica, A or B, undesirable, and then A or B unlikely. Um, I I think I'm with Stuart on scenario B. Uh, um, I think something to say, uh, particularly sort of on that point about London and the South East, is that actually in London we see some of the greatest inequalities as a result of the centralisation. And, you know, we at IPPR North, we talk about the North a lot, understandably, but um, we, can't, we can't just disregard the fact that some of these inequalities we see in London are huge. Um, so, yeah, I think I would go with, with B. Andrew. Final well, word. as as framed, I think you know you, you can you can only go for B. I mean, the way that Joe, you know, it bless him, has kind of set it out. So I think there is the B is is kind of. But I would say, I mean, a part of the kind of a new model or whatever it is, I think we do have to think much more about uh, the role of our kind of bigger urban areas outside of the Greater Southeast, particularly Greater Birmingham, Manchester, and others. I think there's an awful lot more. In, a, in whatever model it is that they could they could do if we enable them to do it uh, and to drive prosperity in their place and between their places in a broader a broader sense. I think that would be part of my model. In terms of likelihood, sadly, I think we're probably going to be in A because of the way that the system and, in fact, the way that local economic development, regional economic development is set up. In a sense, we are encouraging places to think that, that scenario A is achievable. And I think that's a bit of a... Uh, a mistake for many places not for all places but for many places i think i'd have to agree with you i'm going to bring us to a close can i just say thank you so much uh to all of you for um a fantastic really thoughtful really detailed uh conversation that i think has kicked around leveling up um gone into the details, come up with solutions, uh, critiqued, uh, lifted us up, <laughs> pushed us down uh, <laughs> and taken us to this place. So I think it's been a brilliant conversation. Thank you uh, to um, all uh, the sort of comments uh, and questions that came through. Um, I guess there's sort of a few points just to sort of sum up. Um, it definitely feels like it is better that we have this white paper than if we didn't have it. Uh, the fact that levelling up is a thing, the fact that there is now a focus and locus that moves us beyond growth actually and does talk about living standards does feel like an advancement on the agenda. Um, and there are clearly positives in that, um, in the agenda the government set out. I think that, 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 that point about institutional change uh, which you didn't have to have in there. Um, we don't know exactly what it will look like or what it will mean, but I think it signals something that we can build on um, and work towards. As does devolution. Uh, yes, it's deals-based, it's patchy, it's frustrating, um, but it does, again, give us the scope uh, to move the agenda beyond. And again, there was a world in which the government could have tried to do levelling up from the Treasury, uh, and it didn't. Uh, so that, I think, is definitely positive. Um, I think the point on investment was made by all of you really well, um, which is the capacity to do this. Uh, it is constrained um, or enabled by the investment commitment, commitment. And that's not just physical, that's about places, that's about social infrastructure, that's about communities. And that's possibly something that the government will come under pressure on. I think this question of structural change, uh, this, you know, the point that Joe makes well, scenario A or scenario B, um, does feel like an unanswered question um, that in the end, levelling up might be a symptom of wider uh, structural problems with the economy that means it's just not working for people. So through levelling up, we might put a sticking plaster on it, but unless we get to bigger structural issues, um, the government might, any government might not be able to um, fix this um, and confront this once and for all. Um, uh, and I think the point that you made, uh, Andrew, which I think um, we should hold, which is 
actually regional economic development policy has for too long just shifted the pie around. Um, and we haven't thought about the way in which we grow that pie and who, who benefits. And actually now we have a double challenge that if we are going to grow that pie, we need to do it in a way that is compliant with net zero, that is sustainable. Um, and it feels that that question hasn't been properly grappled uh, yet, but will be a key part of the challenge going forward. Um, and then I wouldn't be from NEF if I didn't end on net zero, uh, which is perhaps uh, the, the, the big missing uh, piece in the agenda, an opportunity. Um, I think there maybe was like one sentence on net zero, so it wasn't completely lost in the white paper. And so perhaps uh, more for us to build on as we move forward. Um, but the fact that we're having this conversation feels like the right space. Um, and I think actually, to be fair to the government, they were very clear that the white paper was the first step in a process, the first step in the conversation. So progress for now, much, much more to do. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone uh, for listening to us, for engaging, for putting comments and for questions. Uh, and I hope this is going to be the first of many more conversations on levelling up. Good night. Bye, everybody. Thanks for coming. <laughs>